Welcome everyone and thank you for joining this presentation, Virtual Teamwork and Mentorship in the Time of COVID-19. We have two chat options, one of them on the right-hand screen and one in the blue bar below this video. To best organize questions for the speakers, we would like you to use the chat feature in the blue bar for this purpose, but we will be monitoring both chats for your questions and comments. Please participate in the session by sharing thoughts, posing links to resources, uh, or posting links to resources and or asking your questions. If you're asking a question to the speaker, please use a question mark uh, at the beginning of the question. This makes it easy for us to scroll through and identify the questions. Now I'd like to hand it off to our moderator for the session, Robert Griffiths, and we'll get started. And I will also go ahead and share, um, share my screen. Thanks so much, Rosa, and thank you all so much for being here and sharing your time with us. I hope that your conference experience is going well and that you're making great connections to your work and are finding opportunities to expand your professional network. Everyone, I'm, I'm Rob Grimitz. I'm the Associate Vice President for Distance Education at Ohio State, but uh, you'll know me best as your moderator and timekeeper for today's session, and let me do that moderator type of work now by introducing our panelists. Mandy Taylor, instructional designer and lecturer, has been working for the Office of Academic Technology and Innovation at California State University, San Bernardino, since June 2020. Before working for ATI, she taught English at CSU San Bernardino for about 10 years. Mandy has varied research interests and has always been an advocate of education. She is currently pursuing a master's degree in instructional design and technology at CSU Fullerton. Marusio Kadavid, Sorry if I mispronounced that, Katavid. Ah, good. Senior instructional designer and lecturer has worked for the Office of Academic Technology and Innovation for the last 14 years. During this time, he has learned and used editing software, multimedia software, and production software. But one of his most fulfilling experiences has been training faculty in several learning management systems like Moodle, Blackboard, Blackboard Ultra, Canvas, as well as adjunct faculty for the Information Decision Scientists, Sciences and the Master in Instructional Design. But before we get into the heart of what Mandy and Marusio will be sharing with us, I do have a few asks of you. We are very interested in and are encouraging your questions and ideas. So the best way for our presenters to help set the stage and provide flow and connections for you as we get going here will be for them to talk through the content and address your feedback and questions at the end. Therefore, we're asking kindly that you put your questions into the Zoom chat Throughout the session here and after the presenters have provided their initial content, we'll be pulling the questions from Zoom. And then also in real time near the end, we will be asking for your participation by you raising your hand or sending a note in chat that you are ready to share your question or comment and have you unmute yourself at that point. So good, thank you, great, glad you're here. And I'm going to turn it over to Mandy for part one of their presentation. Hello, oh, and my name is Mandy Taylor, and thank you for being with us. And I'm actually going to pass it to Mauricio for this particular first part of the slide, and then I'll be back with you in just a few moments. Thank you, Mandy. Don't you just love this? Um, so this one is just going to be a very quick intro. Um, you know, just to set up the stage for what we're going to talk about, as you know, this is about uh, mentoring uh, and team building during the pandemic. In today's presentation, some of the things that we're going to talk about is to give you a little bit of a context about, you know, who we are and what we are doing, both, you know, from uh, institutional perspective as well as an individual perspective. We'll talk about the necessity and benefits um, of workplace mentoring and its effects on, um, on team building. Uh, where's the next bullet point? Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about how ATI, our department here at CSUSB, adjusted to an old remote uh, workplace, uh, workplace and what it actually went into. And then um, hopefully we're going to end with um, some of the uh, hard learned lessons and practical advice and strategies for team building and mentorship as we move um, forward. So that's kind of like, you know, to, to sort of frame our presentation uh, today and uh, go back to, to Mandy. Thank you, Mauricio. And so what I'd like to do first is I know that um, Robert said that we weren't going to um, have you talk first, but what I would like us to do is a bit of a chat activity. So if you could get ready to type um, a little bit and if we could monitor the chat, I'm going to do what I call kind of a three, two, one share. Um, I have a question 
and please type a one word or short phrase in chat. And then I'll count down briefly three, two, one, and then just enter um, your response to the question. And we'll kind of talk through those. Um, Marisa and I will talk through those a little bit, um, and then we'll um, go on from there. So the first question that I have, I'll give you a few seconds to think about it, is how would you describe a mentor? What is a mentor? In one word or a short phrase, um, what is a mentor to you? So I'll give you just a few seconds. So think about it, go ahead and get it written in chat. Okay, and three, two, one, share whenever you are ready. Great. I'm seeing a coach, someone who helps you through a process, guidance, someone with experience. Oh, I like that. Someone who helps answer questions altruistically. Yes, mentors deal with a lot of questions. It's something I'll be talking about a little bit later. Advocate, that's a good one as well. Having feedback, yep. I love the Courtney said in parentheses, good and bad, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Crucial conversations, you know, come into place when it comes to giving feedback. <laughs> yes, yes. And mentors ideally are the kind of the safe place or the safe person to do that, um, especially if they are a peer mentor. Um, there's a more equal relationship there. Um, something we'll continue to talk about. Great. Okay. So go ahead and keep answering that. If you will have one of the couple more questions that I want to make sure we get to. So the second question today is what are some benefits? Oops, a little too quick there. Try that again. What are some benefits of mentoring? And this can be either for the person being mentored or the one who is a mentor. What are some benefits of mentorship? Just go ahead and share whenever you're ready. I won't do the countdown for it. Relationships, safe place to ask questions. Absolutely, Emily, thank you. Shared experience, yeah, it's a great. We should have done polls before we did this presentation, Mauricio. <laughs> Career advancement, yes. Learn from others' mistakes. Very nice. I like the having a safe place to ask questions. Mm -hmm. Sounding boards, mutual learning. That's a good one, Patrick. Motivation, absolutely. Mm. Mm -hmm. Actual help and also emotional support. Yes. Everybody watched our presentation before or something. I, Maybe I think... our, our slide deck was shared with everybody who was going to be here and they read it before. Presentation done. Just kidding. It's not done. Um, but yes, these absolutely. These are things uh, that we'll be talking about. Okay. And so let's talk then. Being able, yeah. Being able to see things that I cannot see because I'm blindsided. Sometimes we don't know what we aren't seeing. Absolutely, or we're so focused on something, we're not quite sure um, what we should be seeing. Absolutely. Okay. And one last question with this, what are some obstacles to mentoring? Um, again, this could be from the person being mentored perspective or the person giving mentorship. Um, what are some obstacles to mentoring? Stop moving my mouse. <laughs> oh, yep. Time, difficulty connecting, expertise, lack of mentors, not wanting to commit, lack of trust. Yes. For the mentee, not knowing where to get help. Knowing the right people or knowing where to find the help is often a big part of the battle um, in getting mentorship. Absolutely. Good to know versus need to know information. Yep. Information overload can be a big barrier sometimes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And Judy says role conflict. Yes, I've experienced that in the past with regards to uh, the roles that we are assigned within teams and mentorship. And T not opening up. Yes. Um, having that openness in that relationship. 
I mean, it's very important. And that can be hard to achieve for several of the reasons that have been talked about. You know, finding that good match in a mentor and understanding kind of what the needs of the relationship might be. Absolutely. Excuse me. Okay. All right, thank you. If you have more ideas about any of these questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit more about the why of workplace mentorship or workplace mentoring. Um, so, but to effectively talk about workplace mentoring, I need to share a bit of my own story. This is part of the impetus for this presentation. Um, in February 2020, my now colleague, Ron, suggested that I apply for an instructional designer position here at CSU San Bernardino. Um, at the time, I was a part-time lecturer in the English and Natural Science departments. Um, I was eventually planning on a career shift to instructional design, but the timing was very surprising to me. Um, it was a couple of years early um, for my search at the time. Uh, Ron and I had worked together on the design for a fully asynchronous writing course um, that was a lot more involved than I anticipated course design actually being, so it was good that I had an instructional designer to work with there. Um, but Ron thought I might be a good fit for the position, said I should apply. I'm like, I don't know. I, I protested a little bit. Um, I didn't have a degree yet in the field, um, and I wasn't quite sure I was ready for that. However, after consulting with my family and talking through um, with some close friends as well, I submitted the application um, and then just went about my teaching career um, at the time. I, you, like you apply for a job, you don't know what's going to happen, so you have to keep doing what you're doing. Um, so that was in February and then in March, two days, actually on my birthday, I was contacted for the initial interview, which was to take place two days later um, via Zoom. Um, our campus had just transitioned to fully on fully remote teaching and work um, due to the first set of COVID restrictions. So I was going to interview for a new job while also um, shifting my teaching for the last week of our, at that time, 10 week quarters. Um, a month after that interview, um, I was contacted for a second interview that would be four hours multi-part, also via Zoom. About three weeks after that, um, I was offered the position. Um, and in June of 2020, I submitted the last batch of my grading of my teaching career um, thus far and started my job. <laughs> Sorry, I just saw the chat of four hours of Zoom makes a Zoom be yes. It was a very long day, but I had the opportunity to um, do that from my home. So um, I was at least in a familiar space, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so I started my job four days after turning in my final grades. And so, yeah, I started a brand new career, brand new job in the midst of a global pandemic. Working from home, um, from an ad hoc home office uh, for just about over a year from June to July, 2021, we are now back in person on campus. Um, at the time, I didn't really understand what instructional designers do. Some days I'm still not sure everything that we're, we do and I was in desperate need of mentorship. The question though becomes why in-person mentorship? Why is somebody to talk to? Why not just give me a bunch of documents or videos? Um, so let me talk about that. So as mentioned in the chat responses, workplace mentoring or mentoring in general builds relationships. Uh, fortunately, I was paired with two designers on my team um, they helped me get a better idea of what I needed to do and were very gracious in answering all of my questions. I had a lot of questions. Um, Cronin 2020 states that mentoring can be extremely valuable in general, but also in particular in situations like mine. By pairing a new hire with a mentor or two on their first day, they can have somebody who shows them the ropes in a friendly, relatable, and patient way. Such mentorship will increase, <coughs> excuse me, such mentorship also increases the number of initial connections for a new hire within the company or institution. And if my assigned mentors didn't know how to answer my questions, and I asked a lot and still do, they pointed me to the people who could. Um, and this um, helped build emotional and psychological comfort, which is also something mentioned in the chat activity. 
Um, having mentors made me feel more comfortable in my position. Um, Cronin states that at its core, mentoring is about human connection. And these human connections can build that um, well of emotional support and psychological support um, on the days where it's like, I really just don't have any idea what I'm doing and why am I here, what, what's supposed to happen. I could go to my mentors and say, can you help me? What can I help you with? Can you tell me what I'm supposed to do? How does this work? What does this do? Who can I talk to? Things like that. Or just, hi team, I'm having a rough day today. Um, there are a few days that I couldn't remember even the simplest of commands or simplest of procedures. And it was helpful to have somebody there to answer those questions. Um, as an instructor, when I was teaching, I typically worked more by myself um, and rarely interacted with my colleagues. Now, though, on the instructional design team, I was part of a team and part of a team, and there were people who could help me. Um, no one was further away than a Microsoft Teams message or a Zoom call or a Teams call or some type of um, virtual connection. Um, I didn't realize how dependent I was on this communication um, until I had a dream a few weeks in to the new job. Um, in my dream, it was a very, very busy day as things were then and still can be. But in my dream that day, one by one, all of my colleagues left and they left without any communication and they left with radio silence. There was no way to get a hold of them, you know, no Teams, no Zoom, no phone calls, no way to get in touch. And finally, it was just down to me and another new colleague trying to cope with all of the support requests. And it's kind of like, you know, picture an avalanche of paper, or except it was like phone call after phone call. But I woke up before I knew if we succeeded or not in handling all of the requests. So it was the next day, came back to work, and I'm like, oh, everybody's here. Oh, good. I'm not by myself. Um, and hopefully, I would be able to cope with that a little bit better. Yep. Got it. And so we have a human connection as well um, with workplace mentoring, and that connection enhances effectiveness um, in our teams. <clears throat> so also, when we have more effective relationships with, with each other, that can spur collaboration, um, as is evidenced in our presentation today. Um, for example, with Mauricio, um, I met Mauricio a couple of weeks into my position, like I'd met him before, but um, I was given an assignment to help him and I started asking him a lot of questions. Um, I learned to exhaust all of my options before I asked him questions or brought him problems to help me solve. Um, and the first time I presented him, um, he usually asked me to go through all of the options. And the first time I said, okay, Mauricio, I've done A, B, C, all the way through H. What can we do? And he said, oh, we need to escalate the problem. <laughs> okay, it's finally something he can't solve too. And so, yay, um, finally stumped him. But then I learned the benefits of escalation and made another network contact of who to then, who to then talk to. Um, so the benefits of workplace mentoring as well. We talk a little bit more about those. The benefits of workplace mentoring undergird the why of workplace mentoring. In the anecdotes I've shared, we've seen all of these um, points on the slide in action. Um, effective mentoring and the relationships it builds is one of the best ways to um, improve, um, yep, to improve employee retention um, and mentors can help all of this. Particularly, they can help share the cognitive load um, for um, this work. Mentors can make those connections and bring us to the places that we want to be. And so in this as well, workplace mentoring affects team building in the sense that we build trust amongst each other with mentorship relationships, those one-on-ones. We eventually can work our way around to the whole team and get to know everybody better. We learn what people are strong at, what they can do well, um, and then we start to be able to talk to each other more. Um, and in that, we also start to build our own skill set by saying, can you help me with this? Can you teach me this? Well, let's work together on these projects. Um, and with that in mind, I'm going to turn the time back to Mauricio to talk a bit about how the ATI team functioned um, pre-pandemic and 
during the pandemic. Thank you, Mandy. I'm just, uh, there you go. Um, I'm just requesting remote control of the slide so I can, you know, go into my section here. Sorry, folks, just a sec here. Trying to switch on remote control. Um, take me. Okay, here we go. Uh, thank you, Mandy. You know, it's always so important to actually hear from those who went through the the experience, uh, you know, being hired during the pandemic. But to understand this a little bit better um, as to how we became to actually implement a mentorship um, and where we were, you know, um, ATI with regards to institutional history is, um, to put it into context, our university is a face-to-face um, -face university, right? So we only had about three to five percent of online classes. Um, you know, very few students. Um, about 700, 800 students out of the 22, 24,000 students. You know, pre-pandemic that we had, and so our mentality here was to to actually work face-to-face -face and only provide support to uh, those folks that were you know sort of like online and faculty and stuff like that. So. Our, our institutional workforce, you know, let's say for our department was very siloed, right? Um, we had also gone through four different managers by the time the man came here. I've been here for about 16 years. And within the past three years, pre-pandemic, we went through uh, three different, you know, interim set of, set of directors. And so there was a lot of... Um, you know, issues with regards to communication. There were a lot of issues with regards to job descriptions and who was supposed to do what, um, expectations, etc. And that had created um, an environment of micromanaging, you know, so the administrators um, sort of were working with us with regards to we always had to provide specific reports that had a lot of meetings. Uh, we were all working in silos, um, even though we were all within our um, you know the same the same building for example i was brought in from academic affairs into it um it was very like who does this so and so does this who does that so and so does this right so there was there was a, a, a broken culture you know there was no team unity um everybody you know was working specific uh, projects and we all reported directly to um, you know, to the supervisors, but there didn't really seem to be a cohesive understanding, you know, of team building. Right? Nobody really wanted to talk to each other because, well, if you're talking about Turnitin, if you're talking about Softchalk, if you're talking about Go React, if you're talking about this specific thing, um, each of us had our own specialties, and so there was lack of communication. And um, I recognized pre-pandemic that we were what we called, you know, like a team divided. We were all all human beings in the same place, uh, but we didn't really work um, as a team. And so in comes the pandemic. And now we go through that process of, um, are we going to go? Are we not going to go? Is this really going to be uh, permanent? Um, should we just like not even take our stuff home? Uh, are we going to be able to telecommute, not telecommute, etc.? And because we realize at that point that there were not institutional procedures or policies put in place on telecommuting and how we we're going to do uh, things. There was a very rapid sort of adjustment to working remotely. So remember, we're going from a really not a mentoring, you know, sort of environment uh, pre-pandemic, uh, a team divided, people working in silos, even though we were in the same place, to now actually being physically separated, um, you know, people living you know, an hour away from, from us, um, et cetera. And so um, some of the things that needed to be put into place had, how are we going to communicate? Um, how are we actually going to be held accountable for what we do? Um, how are we actually going to distribute um, our responsibilities, um, you know, from supporting a very small number of faculty and students in online courses to all of a sudden supporting a full university, you know, about 1,400 faculty, 
about 22,000 students, you know, a little bit over, well, all classes were, um, you know, were online. How are we actually going to do it? And it was very clear that a team of five uh, people was not necessary and that we actually needed to hire someone else. And that is during the, that hiring process that that man came, came in. Which of course that pointed out to another big problem that we had experienced even even pre-pandemic, which was that we don't have an onboarding process. You know, the onboarding process was always sort of like, oh look, we just hired this person. Hi, how you doing? Uh, I think you're going to work in this particular um, cubicle. Oh yeah, you need a computer. Okay, hold on, I think we can get you a computer. Oh wait, you also need keys, right? Because you need to access the office. So yeah, we need to start that. And so there was really even up to that 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 basic fundamental level um a lot of lacking right a lot of lacking issues and so here we are in the pandemic um you know we're, we are very short with regards to um having someone that can come in and, and hit the 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 the, the, ro the road you know uh, running and stuff like that we hired mandy she comes from the faculty perspective but then she's completely sort of like what do i do now Oh, I don't know. And then, you know, there's no onboarding. Therefore, it's just kind of like, okay, how about if you just start watching videos? How about if you just start doing this? And it was very clear. And remember, all of this is happening right as we are moving away from campus. Um, right as we are also going through a transition from a quarter system to a semester system and right as we are starting to think about an lms change uh, we had just implemented um, actually that year we went from blackboard 9 to blackboard ultra and because we started to experience a lot of problems with blackboard ultra uh, we decided no it needs to be now let's just dump blackboard we need to go over to uh, to canvas so we're having not just the pandemic issues, not just a broken team of people that are not communicating, and people that are not wanting to bother each other, or people that are working in individual sort of projects, um, to now being all you know, sort of like in this place of, um, you know, Spanish word incertidumbre, just kind of like doubting what is it that we're going to do, um, and all of this was presented to us, you know, um, right away. And so a lot of things needed to be done. And as I mentioned, communication was the first part of it, which is how to communicate. Uh, when do we communicate? Um, what do we communicate? Who communicates with whom? What are the channels of communication? And slowly by the use of Slack, by the use of Teams, uh, obviously by the use of, of Zoom, we started to sort of um, develop um, some of these um, new practices, you know, with regards to when are we going to meet? Or what are we going to talk about? How do we actually start to uh, manage our, our workload? And those were part of the adjustments you know that happened and it took us quite some time and by some time you know i'm talking about two to three months you know mandy comes in and um, all of a sudden i have this new person who is sending me texts and emails hey mauricio i was told you know to come to you <laughs> because you know about this hey mauricio i heard that you know about this hey mauricio uh, can you help me with uh with this and it, would, it became very clear that i could not just simply you know send her links or youtube videos um not only because that would not have worked but also because of, of mandy's personality and in, in the academic you know um approach of I need to learn, you know, to do this, that we began to ask the questions of like, well, if we can do that for Mandy, why can't we do it for the rest of everybody else? Why is it that I cannot learn about this particular tool that one of my teammates knows about? Why is it that I cannot teach somebody else about, you know, this, this particular tool that I know or process that I know um, that nobody else knows about? And so now all of a sudden, we are in in you know experiencing those effects of the transition right um and we're starting to think about um who's gonna get uh what done who's gonna do this why they're gonna do it and realizing that you know mandy and i were talking about that it became very clear that although each of us was in our own boat we were all in individual boats in this huge lake and we realized we couldn't really get anything done unless we actually not just jumped into you know the same boat but we actually just thather you know just connected all of those um uh, boats right and so 
all of a sudden we started to experience an increase in productivity. How did we increase, you know, uh, productivity, you know, while everything else was going on? Well, one was because each of us became accountable of our own times. Um, each of us started to develop open communication channels with each other and to able to say, no, I can't, or yes, I can help. We also developed something that was a ticket day. Um, we had a ticketing system in which we needed to treat um, all the tickets, you know, faculty and student support tickets with regards to can we actually help them? Um, what are the resources in the university, you know, that we have? So by the implementation of the ticketing system, um, we were able to then identify what was instructional design support versus what was technical support versus what was just simply, you know, someone wanting to vent or complain about a tool that is not sort of working. We put that into ticket days and unfortunately, well, I said unfortunately, but I think it was kind of like a, um, now um, we, in retrospect, it was a good thing is that then Mandy started to, Mandy and our new designer started to actually take care of all of those tickets, which put her <clears throat> at the forefront of fielding, you know, all of these questions, right? And also giving her um, a, a sense of like, I know this, right? Plus, because all of these questions were coming in and she was focused and trying to answer, it allowed her to actually go to each of us and ask those questions. Can you help me do this? And instead of saying, can you do it? You know, here's a ticket. Can you do it? Um, relationships started to be formed, you know, between Mandy and, and, and all of us. Um, and then among all of us to actually say, I can help you with this. You know what? Instead of me telling you to do it or me taking it away from you, we can work together. And so collaboration became, you know, something that I was very important. And um, I hate to use the word miraculously, but all of a sudden realizing that we were all overworked, we were working about 14 hour days, about six days a week, right, um, in, the, in the transition, um, that we actually, um, you know, we're, we're zoomed out and tired. Um, all of a sudden, we started to feel that I'm not just alone in this. And as productivity began, you know, to go up, a sense of, of team started to, to develop, you know, within us. We started to develop, you know, Google Drives in which we were actually adding, you know, some of the um, information that we were learning, some of the links and resources that we were learning. And um, eventually what that did is that it helped us prepare, you know, for um, coming back to, um, you know, to face-to-face. -to -face. And uh, by the way, something else that, that really occurred which is one of the things that we'll say at the end is it's so important, you know, in order to do both mentoring and uh, team building to understand communication styles of, of people, you know, who the introverts are, who the extroverts are, um, who is willing to ask questions, who is willing to be able to uh, be mentored, um, who's going to actually come to you versus who is actually going to just wait until you go to them. And all of those uh, things we, we never had to deal with when we were face to face, but we actually had to be, you know, we were face to face, we were faced you know, during the virtual uh, pandemic, you know, with trying to understand those things. And so in a way, that's kind of like how we went from, you know, pre-pandemic to what we were able to do during the pandemic. Um, we successfully were able to then have an LMS implementation. We successfully were able to support uh, faculty. We've trained, um, you know, close to uh, 700 new faculty, you know, and uh, well, what was the, the old Blackboard, um, also the new um, Ultra, we created, um, you know, webinars and, and a sustainability page, you know, all supported by us, you know, creating how-to videos and how-to guidelines. We were able to actually change a little bit of the image of us instructional designers going from being, you know, people working in the basement of the library, you know, as IT and button pushers to actually having an image of, of someone, you know, who knows about pedagogy, someone that can actually support, someone that it's not just simply using technology for technology's sake, but most importantly that we were working together. We started to have meetings to understand, um, you know, 
do we all send this particular message? Uh, what do we think about uh, this particular tool? How do we present this particular workshop? And those things didn't exist, you know, pre-pandemic. Those things, you know, all develop, you know, during during the pandemic. And um, and so that's that's kind of a little bit of, of what happened and how it happened. And we are happy to, um, you know, to be able to bring that back, you know, into face-to-face -face and then continue to have those, you know, communications via teams, you know, continue to have, you know, um, go to lunch together with with some of them, understand, you know, some of the needs that, that some of us have and the open channels of communication now um, are still continue to be, you know, continue to be open and do collaboration. So, so that's great. And I think with that, um, that's kind of like my portion a little bit and I, I want to send it back to, to, to Mandy. Thank you, Mauricio. Um, so what I'd like to do just very briefly, and Mauricio covered um, part of it as well, is my own experience coming into the team. Um, I didn't know the backstory of the team at all. I didn't know what had happened um, as they transitioned in um, from what they had been into the pandemic. I didn't know all of that history until um, relatively recently, actually. Um, I was kind of head down, kind of learning my my job for a long time, still feel like I'm learning. Um, but as he mentioned, there was really no onboarding um, program or training for me. Um, I was given a library of webinars to watch, a couple of LinkedIn learning courses to watch, and then it was just a matter of experience and time and asking a lot of people a lot of questions and sometimes the same questions more than once just to make sure that I was doing things um, properly. Um, like I had people skills from teaching and from other collaborations that I'd done. Um, so I knew how to talk to people and how to write and communicate, but it was kind of the the day-to-day -day things I wasn't quite sure about. Um, and the onboarding experience um, is something that is vital. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later, uh, very briefly. Um, and without um, that formal experience, um, I was a little lost some days um, and for a while. Um, and it would have been very helpful to have had um, a somewhat formal or at least some program to follow. Um, I like structure and Mauricio um, noted, you know, I come from an academic background. So the student in me really wanted to dive into some materials and not having those was a little bit difficult. However, given the mentors that I had um, and I came into a pretty welcoming team, um, I had the sense pretty quickly that um, I was wanted and needed um, and that um, as soon as I could get my, you know, my feet under me um, and be helpful, um, then it would be all the better for everyone. Um, and so my mentors were vital in that experience um, and they helped kind of smooth the way. And as I learned to know who to ask about what questions or what issues, and um, that has helped as well and um, built into other projects and other opportunities. What really worked well for me in this experience was the communication, um, especially the virtual communication and teams, particularly um, and email. Um, I'm a writer by trade. I taught writing for a long time. So I'd much rather write if I have the opportunity than to extemporaneously speak, which is weird sounding coming from a teacher. Um, but the, the opportunity to write and to think through my thoughts um, in that communication that I have with my team um, also, the virtual ex um, interview experience, that although my second interview was four hours long on Zoom, I was home, I was in a room that I knew well, I knew the area, I didn't feel surrounded by people because it was a panel interview, so I didn't feel like I was facing a firing squad or something that was going to you know, hurt in some way. Um, I saw faces on the screen and they, I was able to kind of match names and faces and, and see who I could at that time. Um, some of the things that need improvement, I'm going to go back to onboarding. Um, that would be a whole presentation in itself. Um, and I'm actually helping, we still don't have an onboarding program, let's put it that way. Um, I'm trying to rectify that one small project at a time um, so that somebody doesn't come into the position um, without at least something that they can go to. And I've gotten a lot of ideas um, from this conference on how I can um, actually implement some of those things. Um, also, what would help is some more proactive mentoring. 
I did have mentors, but it was expected that I would ask questions rather than um, they kind of guiding me through different things. So um, having somebody more um, willing to kind of say, hey, help me with this project, or can you do this for or with me, um, as opposed to me always asking, hey, can I help you and being told no, I don't really have anything that you can help with at this time. Um, so I adjusted, um, I'm a self-directed learner and I really wanted to, to do the job and learn it well. Um, so I made my way through, but some employees may not have that same drive or that experience. So um, having some formal help would be useful with that. Um, so finally, with that kind of some advice and strategies, and Mauricio's um, hit on some of them already, and this is kind of a tag team portion, um, is that we need to know your team. And I'll let Mauricio talk about that a little bit more. Thank you, Mandy. And you know what I'll do, Mandy, instead of asking, you know, remote um, access and stuff like that, I'll just finish this part and then you can go to yours and stuff. So, yes, um, I'm, I'm, I'm actively on the chat here, you know, just, just hearing some very wonderful things with regards to Slack, um, you know, Teams, Google Chats and everything and, and, and trivia and stuff. And that actually goes uh, directly into into what this is about, like, know your team. Um some of the things that we did is we needed to understand socializing preferences. Like I'm an introvert, right? And I could just close my my door um, and then just do my job. And if you need me, you come to me, but I'm not going to go out and do, you know, water cooler conversations and stuff like that. That's in, in person. However, one of the things that did happen by using those communication tools and with regards about knowing your team is like, for example, I discovered that Mandy is an avid college football follower, which so am I. And so now all of a sudden, come Monday, um, you know, we had things to talk about with regards to how her team did, how my team did and stuff like that. We have another team member that um, loves bowling and is into a bowling league and stuff like that. Um, also, we've brought that in into our designer meetings on Mondays, where we spend the first 15, 20 minutes, you know, just simply talking about what did you do that is non-work related? You know, finding out, you know, that that somebody's kid, for example, just played on their first baseball game, you know, um, or again, that, that somebody just went to a cousin's wedding somewhere else, or that one of our team members, you know, went to like New Mexico and, you know, to a, um, an altar where they had sand and then she ate that sand because it was holy sand and then she got sick, right? And all of these things are, are outside of, of work, but they're helping us know our teams, you know, learning about all of the different things that, that we are, all the shows that we're watching. When I was watching Supernatural and learning that Mandy actually uh, loves Supernatural, you know, on, on Netflix, all of those different things had to do with who our team is. How do we communicate? Consider our communication preferences and styles. That's really, really important. Uh, some of our team members, they don't want emails, but they're very good at chat. A quick question, a quick answer, you're done. You got what you needed to do. And to get done, you got the answer. You don't have to go, you know, and have a Zoom meeting. You don't have to go and stand in their cubicles. You don't have to go to lunch. But other people actually like to go for a walk, you know, and discuss things. So know your team, understand socialization preferences, um, general areas of expertise. You know, even though we went from silos and treating everybody as like, oh, well, you're the expert on this. Oh, well, you're the expert on that. All of a sudden, we embrace that. So if there is a faculty that comes with a question about um, you doing H5P or soft chalk or voice thread, right? Um, we don't just simply say, oh, you know, go to so-and-so. We actually collaborate with that person so that we also learn, but then we treat them as, you know, subject matter experts on that particular tool and stuff like that. And another thing is um, what are some, and, and you guys, some of you mentioned in the chat about the role of the mentor and identifying, you know, when you're working with your mentee is what are your career and life goals? Some people are doing this temporarily. I also do this for the interns that come from the master's program in the instructional design. Some of them, they just barely learned what instructional design was and they thought it sounds cool, 
the moment that I meet with them and I show them all of the different aspects of instructional design, they may say, oh yeah, I'm not very good at working with faculty, but I'm great on graphic design. So maybe I go, you know, the virtual, you know, um, reality type of road and everything. So knowing who they are, what their goals and what their career expectations are, it's really important. Mandy? Thank you. So also part of this, want to build and encourage trust among team members. And um, this can start with giving clear and um, assignments and clear instructions for those assignments if team members are given particular duties. Also, um, let people do their jobs. I know that sounds really simple, but it can be um, problematic sometimes because you're trusting like, oh, you have this big project. I need it by you know a month from now report back to me and then you have to need to trust that they will get it done um, and that it will get done even if it's not in the way that you want you you would have done it um, we all approach things differently um, as long as the parameters are met um, and the goals are done um, or met um, the method may not be um, all that important um, for some tasks sometimes the tasks do need to be better structured for that. So encouraging trust and um, that can be, you know, build small opportunities. Those can lead into um, opportunities for collaboration. Um, for example, um, Mauricio and I had to trust each other that we would be prepared for today. Um, we've worked together long enough that we knew we would be, but it still kind of came down to the, are we ready? You sure we're ready? I guess so. Here we are. Um, anything. And so building that trust amongst each other and um, collaborating um, is also a part of building our team. Well, Mandy, thank you. I mean, uh, we'll keep this one very short because that actually is um, one of the big things. Um, part of this knowing your team and building and encouraging trust with your team or, uh, team members is I love to, pre to present. You know, um, I'm presenting today. I'm presenting this week at another conference. You know, Mandy and I have other papers to present um, other places. Some of our team members they want to go conferences, but they don't want to necessarily, you know, be up front, you know, no talking, but not just, you know, I had to change my mentality with regards to collaboration it needed to be something like, let's write an article, a journal article is to present at a conferences. Actually, some people don't want to do that. That's, that's not what they like to do, but they do want to be involved. If I am working with the faculty on developing, you know, for example, an engaging lesson, you know, using a particular tool, you know, let's say like right now with H5P um, or someone who actually just wants to be involved in learning, um, you know, going with me to meetings, if I'm meeting a particular chair of a department, because we're now going to be doing program level evaluations rather than course level evaluations. So there are always opportunities, you know, uh, for collaborate. And, and it is fantastic to actually have someone there who they feel that you trust them, uh, that you've, you know that you can trust um, them and that you are finding something in common that you can actually work together, you know, uh, for collaboration. So, Mandy? And I'll just take us through kind of the last few points that we have. Um, I've already talked about this a lot, but just keep in mind onboarding new hires is vital. That includes mentorship, that includes um, position descriptions, all sorts of things days in the life, shadowing if possible, um, that builds the team. You know, the new hire gets to know people and make those connections um, and gets to know um, kind of a little bit more of the team culture. That can be hard to do virtually. Um, I think our team succeeded pretty well, at least when, when I began, I felt very included very quickly. Um, and it's been really helpful and interesting um, and encouraging to see that it is possible. Um, we also, along those lines, need consistent but not constant communication. Um, that's a fine balance to strike. Sometimes, you know, sometimes there needs to be a lot of talk to make sure that a problem gets solved or something's done. Um, but you also want to make sure you're not bombarding people with um, messages that don't, you know, that aren't pertinent to the to the job at the time. There's not that we can't chatter or talk or do things or share things to kind of lighten the, the moment as needed, but just be mindful of how much um, you are trying to communicate with someone. Um, and then finally, if that, oops, wrong way, this way, rotate mentors, give people the opportunity to meet others. Um, and sometimes mentorship relationships need to flip. There might be things that I know better um, than, you know, even though I'm new, than someone who's 
you know, who's more experienced. Um, like, not to put him on the spot, but um, Mauricio is like our Blackboard Ultra specialist. Um, and when we switched to Canvas, um, I started helping with Canvas um, and kind of um, took a bit of a lead on that as well. And so, um, you know, I help Mauricio with Canvas stuff. He still helps me with Blackboard Ultra because we're still supporting Blackboard at this time as we continue our, our um, transition. But um, those relationships can change in different projects, different needs. Um, so one day I might be the mentee or the mentor, and it might depend on who I'm working with. And giving that opportunity for that rotation can help um, build team membership, to build team cohesiveness um, and a sense of purpose in team members. Um, and we will stop there. Thank you for your time and attention. And we would be happy to answer further questions or continue talking um, as time permits. Andy Marusio, thank you so very much for this wonderful introduction. I've been monitoring the chat as well. We don't have anything there quite yet. And while we are waiting for folks to be able to put their questions into the chat and or put their hand up or indicate that they're ready to speak here, I, I do have a couple of questions based on what you presented that I can help kick us off and, and hopefully others will be able to join in. So you talked a lot about the evolution that you experienced helping to move toward the sense of team as you move through the, the pandemic here. And finding that you are operating in ways that are uh, more meaningful and thoughtful and, and connecting than where you were before. And I'm, I'm wondering beyond the experience and your impression of how that was, do you have a formal set of voice of the employee or other assessment measures around the cohesiveness of the team or the culture or the feeling of the team that helps you also track how you are doing in this space? Andy, are you no? trying to talk or? <laughs> no, I was just kind of the, looking at you. I was like, I don't, I don't think so. we don't think we have any formal measures um, to do that that I know of. Um, do you know of any? Yeah, anything? no, I think um, um, there are definitely areas of improvement. You know, with uh, with regards to our our morale. Once we came back, you know, actually, uh, Robert, we we realized that. Uh, a lot of the strength in the communication that we had had because we were forced to have it, you know, being virtually, that now that we are present, um, we're starting to sort of fall back into those, like, we don't have to be in teams now all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, we don't have to, you know, before, you know, being, being uh, telecommuting from home, being in teams meant that um, you could go and say, I have to take the car in for repaired, I'll be on teams. And so while they're sitting there waiting for the car to be repaired, people were just like, oh yeah, I work with that faculty. Oh no, I still have to do this in answering in emails. Now that we're back to face-to-face, -to -face, we've, we've sort of gone back to the mentality of like, if I'm gonna go take the car <laughs> for repair and I'm physically leaving the office, I don't have to be in teams. I'll be like, hey guys, you know, unless you need me, but if don't, sort of like, don't bother me. So there, there are things that I've noticed um, are gonna, you know, are going back to all sort of sort of habits, um, and so unfortunately, you know, to answer your question, there isn't specifically an evaluation. We can just sort of feel, um, you know, the things I've I've brought it up in a couple of, of um, designer meetings. You know, the Monday meetings are sort of like our fielder, um, you know, sort of things. But another thing that has influenced that, unfortunately, is now that we have proven you know, to the university and to the supervisors that this office can actually do so much work remotely. We are now engaged in a whole lot, in, in a higher workload, believe it or not, right now, um, you know, that we're face-to-face -face than how we were, you know, back-to-back. -back. And so now we've sort of um, thought about, we know that we can count on everybody, but we are now also wanting to have our time you know, to, to do the things that, that we need to. But, you know, if right now, if I were to share, um, you know, like a screenshot of, of um, teams, if I were to ask a question within seconds, everybody's jumping in and saying yes, no, or just simple tapping. So there's still things that I wish that we could do, um, you know, with regards to maintaining or having a, a, an evaluation of the temperature of the group. And if anybody has any ideas, that would be fantastic. 
Yeah, Mauricio, I think that there's a question in the chat about expanding upon what you just finished with about the finding the balance, understanding that there was an optimization of people's schedule and work uh, methodology of their work to accomplish all the things that need to be done during remote. Now you're on campus, perhaps commuting across campus, commuting, moving throughout the building in ways that are disrupting that schedule. And maybe you have faculty and fellow staff that are on different types of schedules of remote and in person. How are you finding that balance? What are some of the ways and tactics that you're moving forward with that? So uh, I'll tell you a, a few ones, um, you know, that, that we've, that have sort of seemed to work. And that is one, by sharing our, our calendars. And so by sharing our calendars, we're able to, if I want to, for example, meet with Mandy to ask her something, I can take a look at her calendar or, you know, Jonathan or Fien, and, and and then I'll see either their block or something, and then I'll know, okay, I cannot bother them. They're doing something. Um, that's more for sort of um, fielding, you know, what, what people are do. And I also mentioned that we started to use, well, some of us use Rike and we can actually share it with each other, the projects, you know, that, that we are, are doing. But something that has worked individually, I think is that everybody has become um, self-conscious of their own time and availability, um, availabilities. And so I, for example, on Thursdays, I block Thursdays off, meaning I literally just write block, you know, so that I don't have faculty meetings, so that I don't have anything else um, to help me, by the way, that happens to also be my ticket day, to help me stay grounded with regards to what is it that I need to do before the weekend? Uh, what is it that I need to do that hasn't been done? And then if those are the times that fact that my teammates know that I'm not meeting with faculty that they can actually come and either you know email me or call me or something like that but it's it's a challenge you know to find the balance because it's very easy for us to just simply become self-absorbed you know in in what we are doing and to that it's the communication part I do see a lot of messages Mandy correct me if I'm wrong um, we've become much better in teams for example to say um, I have a doctor's appointment I won't be available between this time and this time um, mm -hmm. sort of thing, right? And that helps us know that if this person is not available, let, let me try to. I've also become very good at asking questions. Um, instead of spending 40 minutes in Google trying to figure something out, I, I just simply go on Teams and I say, has anybody heard about speed grader in Canvas and a potential issue with this? And now I'm shifting that into letting others know that I need help. And if they, they, they can assist, um, I sometimes say either, can you take it over? Can you teach me? Is this too difficult for me to help or something like that? And those are the smaller things that we're still trying to do, but we have, we have some weight. I mean, as Mandy said, like, for example, we still don't have an onboarding message, uh, process and we know that we need to have a minimum of five more designers. So how is that going to, to, to go? So, and, and yes, that idea of constant productivity, um, identifying what productivity is versus being busy, mm -hmm. right? And trying to schedule break times for you. So I do see a lot of my teammates, you know, Mandy and, and the new, uh, the other, um, you know, Jolene, they take that time to go walking. You know, they just say, are you ready for a walk? And they just go and walk because they, they need to, they need to do that. Um, and that is sort of like for them to know, you cannot just simply be, you know, focused on your computer. I have my phone with a timer and I give myself, you know, I'm going to work in this for 30 minutes, regardless of how far I get, mm -hmm. but then I just need to take a break. Otherwise, you know, it continues. And so there is that balance of productivity versus being busy. And that has been a message that has gone to our supervisors. They don't now do not need to see us constantly being busy, uh, but they know that we're actually getting, you know, the work, uh, the work done. Um, and that goes through, you know, the, the reporting systems that we have for them to know what has been done in what time and stuff. Mauricio, Mandy, thank you again so very much. I'm about to turn it over to Rosa here, but I know there were many other questions that we could ask and a lot of places we could deep dive and you just sparked a lot of thoughts and ideas for me and I hope everybody else on the call too. So again, thank you. I want to turn it over to Rosa to help uh, close us out from this session. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending this session. And a huge thank you to our presenters and moderator. A session feedback survey should be popping up on your screen. And we appreciate you taking the time to fill that out. And speakers really enjoy receiving the feedback. 
We recorded the session and it will be available soon for asynchronous viewing. Please join us for one of five sessions coming up next. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone.